it's like kale chips and normal chips. It's okay. the same with art. Businesses can be a force for good. However, I would not just leave it to their good work. I was thinking about how angry I am that the human brain cannot accept more stress. Hello. You want to like introduce who you are? Oh, okay. You... My name is Albert Vrzgula. I'm from Slovakia. Um, I'm a student mm -hmm. right now, university student. I study international relations and European politics. I did and do many different things, part like outside of school. Right now, I'm involved with politics in Slovakia and occasionally entering with my brother-in-law to help him to guide the headliners for music musical events techno parties cool but that's that's more of a hobby rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. a focus i guess to start uh how did you first get into politics like properly i all i was always fascinated by politics mm -hmm. even as a child you know every child or most children are like oh i want to be president you know when like six or what uh I was the same, but then kind of fizzled out. And mm -hmm. then in the teens, I started to become more fascinated by politics as wow. a, as like a, I don't know. It just, you know, you get into that age where you start to think about like, what do you want to actually be? Not like dreams. And I was really not, not politics, but rather like the public sector. So like, the state, the government, mm -hmm. the service to the nation, to the your country. Um, and I started to become more and more fascinated by politics, mainly because, or probably because the politics in Slovakia were always a bit whack. Um, so it just fascinated me, like how the humans choose to govern themselves yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and I like properly when I properly first time got into politics was in 2018. I was very randomly approached by this guy. He just texted me on Facebook on Messenger and he was like, yo, I'd like to meet with you because I've heard that you're doing this. At the time, I was uh, head of PR and marketing for Model European Parliament conference, mm -hmm. which is like a student conference. So this guy approached me and he he was like, I want to meet with you. I'm going to start, I'm going to run for European Parliament. And we've met and it just came up to be that he was running for a party that I'm working with right now. It's a progressive Slovakia party, mm -hmm. so like progressive liberal center left. Um, and yeah, and I was doing marketing for his company, but I was doing all everything else as well. Then, well, he didn't get in, but he got 10,000 votes, which was our goal for the campaign. Uh, 10,000 uh, preferential votes, mm -hmm. which was, it's good. He was, he was 25 years old. Nobody knew him, so it was quite good. Um, and then there was a break because there was kind of a, the elections, the parliamentary elections didn't turn out as the party expected and yeah. they didn't get in, whatever. And I, I also at the time I was in the US, so I was kind of detached. But due to Corona, I came back and I was thinking I was at home, finishing my semester, start changing uni universities. I was thinking like, okay, like, what do I want to do? And yeah, I just joined. I, jo I joined the youth platform. Um, of which I am in the leadership of right now, um, and I also like inter doing an internship for the yeah. party. Something that's interesting. So for context, we met at university in America. Yes. After the first year, you went and transferred back to school in Slovakia. Yeah, Czech Republic. Yes. Czech Republic. What was your experience coming over to America for university like? It was my first time in the U.S. Yeah. Before that, I was twice in the US. One of those times was as a university 
uh, for a summer program, but it wasn't a proper uni uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, my exp it was a culture shock. In pe like when you actually start like living somewhere, you get the culture shock after some time. I think it was due to the school, but the school was very easy for me. Uh, like academics wise, too easy, which is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh yeah, this is easy, I have free time. It was like, what do I do with my free time? I have too much. Um, but I think I, I don't have like a bad feeling towards it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was fine. Would it be safe? to assume or to say that it was very frustrating being like a big fish in a small pond. I wouldn't suppose that I know what you're asking, but the way I was thinking about it was more along these lines. So, okay, I'm a guy from Central Europe or Eastern Europe for some that I okay, worked my ass off to get where I was. And for me, it was like a true, like for, I couldn't even conceive that someone would give me a scholarship that would be worth of know, tens of thousands of dollars to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it, I was, I, you know, it, it was an award for me. It was um, something special. It was, um, it was a symbol for all the work I've done prior mm -hmm. for my CV, for my experience, so that I would be I would be deserving of that kind of money, of that kind of mm, uh, trust. But when I came here and I saw that this program was supposed to be for people who are like highly motivated, like someone like me, and there are like <laughs> a few people like that, and then there's uh, blanks. Mm -hmm. um it it I, it felt like almost like it 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 was a gut punch in a way it was like you know so when we you know when we shared the stories of how we got to the program and it, some of the story was like basically a luck or a randomness <laughs> in itself and mm -hmm. i like and it seemed that they, the people did like minimal work to get in. And I like compared it to my, I wouldn't say struggle, but like, I really, like I worked a lot. Yeah. I, I, and I did it with the purpose in my mind to, that I'm not only doing it because I like it, but I'm doing it because it's important for my future. Yeah. And seeing that someone did not have to go through all that to basically receive the same thing as I did. But like all my work was useless mm. and that I could have just, you know, skip on by and do nothing. Yeah. I don't know how much of this is North America. Probably part of it is just the high school I went to because it was a private school. So that's different. But for that, it was like almost expected that everybody goes to university. At one point, my dad asked if I wanted to take a gap year after high school and I was like I didn't even consider it no of course not like that's the type of people who in my head took gap years I was like no that's not it. like it was just like the expected yeah. thing everybody goes to school in general like public schools it's not to that same degree but I feel like it's kind of that where it's, it's at least mm -hmm. presented as an option <laughs> yeah yeah like what is what's the experience like that well it is the uh, we might have the opposite problem in a way that it is expected that you get a, a university degree mm. even though for example we, we we have in Slovakia we have like too many of certain professions mm. like we have too many graduates of certain certain um you know curriculums or curriculums oh, yeah. or or, or um, you know just like we have too many lawyers for example or like too many social not social workers but like economic economists whatever mm -hmm. like these mm, the things that are considered prestigious or like well paid yeah like we have too many graduates of and it creates like shifts in the work market labor market mm -hmm. um 
and also it's like it's not necessary for a state to have everyone because then it, you know then it creates um to ev for everyone to have a university degree especially when um, we also have too many universities or like not too many but too many that are not high quality um, and you know that creates too too many people with too many diplomas you don't need mm -hmm. and the diplomas aren't worth much yeah so we have you know we have an opposite problem in that sense so it was expected of me to go to university there, there was no other option i think that my experience as well but i think maybe not the, the common experience it seems like you kind of have these at least on the surface seem very different interests yeah <laughs> one in like the po political development world and then the other in like art music fashion how is that for you balancing those two sides of your brain and interests i've i don't know i've so let me start like this when i was little i used to do arts i used to go to drama school yeah and do like the, the do these artsy things because my father's a painter and my sister's a playwright and she was also an actress before she became a playwright. Mm -hmm. And um, she, so so we have this kind of, I was always surrounded by art and I was taught the value of art. Mm -hmm. So I was always very close to that. Um, and for a time I had like this art agency where, um, where I promoted uh, some of my friends, which are artists, and organized exhibitions, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I, I don't know, I always liked art. Um, I, I'm not an artist. I did not um, explore these talents or possible talents mm -hmm. at all or in depth. But I do like, like I do like to be surrounded by art. Like it's very important for my being. It, it's. Uh, I'm uneasy when I don't see art for a long time. Yeah. Um, so. So that's that's why I need to keep this kind of balance in my life, even though it might be secondary to to some things. Mm -hmm. So even though, for example, I had like a very long week in school and had a lot of work with politics, and it's exhausting because politics are exhausting. Um, I can still go to a techno party, uh, be uh, gu guiding um, um, uh, a headliner of the party, go home at eight in the morning the next day. And I would be extremely exhausted physically, but mentally I would be revived. I would be mm. um, actually better off than if I would not go. Yeah. When you started to go into the politics side and like the more just like analytical route, was there any conflict in you where you wanted to do the artistic stuff? Or did you always have in your mind that you were more of the... Well, I think politics are not analytical. Uh -huh. I view politics as a craft. Yeah. As um, it's uh, politics are, they are a science, mm -hmm. uh, of course, you can study it as a science, you can work with it as a science but it's made only by humans politics mm -hmm. it's not as you you know it's not biology you st that you study something living yeah. that wasn't created by the humans but it was like so it's so it's for me politics that's why you when you study politics you have bachelor of arts yeah and not sciences even though it's a, it's a social science but so it's for me politics is like sort of, sort of like art so that's why i say craft somewhere between there needs to be some manual uh, skill yeah. which is the knowledge you have or should have to be an efficient politician mm -hmm. and then there's this you know je ne sais quoi art part which is the creativity that you bring to politics mm. and make them on your own yeah so so i wouldn't say there's a conflict there certainly is maybe a conflict if you're someone like me who who likes to dream about crazy things yeah. that could happen or I could do, yeah. which sort of then it's like, you know, then you're a um, dreamer, which is not good for politics yeah. if you're a dreamer. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't say there's a conflict. I think it's actually yeah. somewhere in between. 
I think we talked about this a bit when we were still talking, but like, what is the general philosophy around art? Obviously, your family is full of artists, so it might skew more support, but like, what is the general view? Are, are most people appreciative? Um, in Slovakia, I mean? Yeah, in Slovakia. I mean, I guess it's the same as everywhere. There are people who go to theater, that go to cinema, go to galleries, go to museums, mm -hmm. and have the ability to appreciate art for what, what it is. And, you know, they don't need to have the art explained to them. Yeah. There's of course people who don't care about art and you know just don't have don't appreciate any value of it. Mm -hmm. Like would lean into a painting or what you know stuff like that. Yeah. Which I think it's the same everywhere with with this kind of. But I, I in general I'd say that as like from like a government standpoint like the culture in Slovakia is severely underfunded mm -hmm. in general it's very hard to be just an artist in slovakia yeah. depends what kind of artist of course but it's very, you have to be you have to have a certain level of success to just do art and, and not, be like yeah oh thing. and there's like a mid-step which is do art and have a profit from it because mm -hmm. usually most of the in independent art is supported by the state through grants mm -hmm. so it's not like you know it's not like you're creating the art um with the hope of selling it for profit yeah. it's always subsidized in a way that's a big question you can probably write an essay about what do you see as value of art like why is it important i would say well first of all art is one of the few things that separates us humans as higher apes mm -hmm. from the rest of the natural world. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any animal right now, apart from humans, that would um, mindfully and with full control create something just for the beauty of it, in a way. Mm -hmm. Because the you know the first rudimentary art was like depictions of life, um, maybe some, you know, uh, carvings of gods, primitive gods or shapes or people around the, you know, the Venus uh, mm. statues or whatever. And I think right now, in the modern time, <laughs> in 21st century art is a very, it's, it's another, the, the information, um, the information part of art became more prevalent, I think, mm. that we started, it was, art was always a way to communicate, any type of art is a type of communication, in my opinion, but the emphasis on communication, I think, became more emphasized, like, emphasized bigger uh, than before, mm. because now you can take a photo and make it an nft you know and it's like a like the information is being layered yeah like from the initial just a snapshot of i don't know someone on the beach you can layer more and more information digitally or otherwise yeah which is more interesting oh yeah and also like art is um an expression tool mm -hmm. it's a communication tool so I think, um, and also if you ever, anyone who's ever decided to um, do art, just paint yeah. with watercolors, it like, you realize like it's not, first of all, it's not that easy to make something nice or something you, even you yourself want to look at all day, yeah. every day. And the second thing is like you, it allows you to get like actually like painting or you know, drawing is one of the very easy things you can do to get into the flow or in mind which allows you to maybe be more introspective which mm -hmm. i think is good i think i hope more people would be introspective and take the time to analyze this, themselves a bit yeah 
There's so many sub points off of that that I want to go into. But one thing, correct me if you think this is accurate or not, in regards to the thing you started off talking about with information being more prevalent in art today, I think historically a lot of art has been about dealing with the unknown of these hard concepts that we can't quite get our mind around, like religious art or feelings, like emotions, things that can't really be articulated or fully understood just by thinking. And so you use art as a way to feel that and make sense of things. And I think what has happened recently is there's a lot more things that people call art that are about stuff like conveying information we do know, like advertisement, where yeah. there's a very specific goal. And it's or like when they know. call um, cooking art. What's that? Like cooking. Cooking, yeah, Like yeah, yeah. when they call chefs artists. Yeah. What do you think? Well, specifically to the chefs being artists, Anthony Bourdain mm -hmm. said something, don't call chefs artists, they're not artists, they're craftsmen. It's yeah. a craft. Um, so yeah, the word art, it is definitely overused mm -hmm. in modern society, but there's so many words that are overused or misused. Mm -hmm. um, also, the specific thing about art is that um, it's something like, it's, it's, mm, it's like kale chips and normal chips. It's okay. the same with art. So you have kale chips, which is like, the doctors or say that oh it's better, um, it's healthier. Yeah. It is it is how it should be, and we can say okay so there's this like artistic consensus on what's art, mm -hmm. or maybe at least which forms or what there is some certain level of consensus of what we consider to be art. Yeah, um, and then there's the other <laughs> the chips which are bad for you you know it's too salty whatever um and that's the whatever else we call art but the people in the universities wouldn't mm. so i think it depends on the viewer however yeah. i wouldn't use the word art for everything that is exists you know like yeah. And I don't think an ad can be art mm -hmm. because I don't know. I just don't like it, the fact that the message is predetermined in a way. Yeah. And it's, um, and it's with uh, like the intention of selling something. Yeah. It's not created for the sake of creation or conveying an emotion mm -hmm. or something i don't i it, it may be artful yeah but it's not art yeah it might because be nice to look at but i think often it's interesting i did an ad for a pretty big beer company and the emotion part is there like you do try to convey the emotion like that's what the team wants but it's tainted in a way yeah. where it's it's a it, you know a brand is a an, it's not a living entity. Yeah. It's like throw it. It's like saying that you paint a rock, and you leave the rock, and the rock falls on its own, makes a mark. Mm -hmm. Is that art? It's an unliving object moving due to physicalities of the earth. Yeah, but I guess like with a brand, it is people like behind it. Yeah, but it's you know it's curate. It's it's weird. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it art. It it feels wrong to call it art. Yeah, and I agree with that sentiment as well. It felt like a little dirty. <laughs> like it's like I was it, because No, you can say like if someone okay, this is art. Like this is if if we use the word art as a hyperbole of greatness. Yeah. Um then it makes sense. But mm -hmm. there's no museums for ads. Yeah, if you don't, don't count I mean, Warhols, which are basically yeah, ads, but, but but he didn't create them as ads, I don't think. No, I don't think so either. It's interesting though the distinction between design and art. Art design. Can, well, th there's a difference. You can study design at a technical university, and yeah. you can study design at an art college, and there's a difference between those two kind of studies. Mm -hmm. The design at the technical university is the practical design, is the factory design is for things and the design for in 
in uh, on the arts in the art school it's still design but it might be design of things which cannot be made mm -hmm. because they would be either useless or wouldn't would fall apart you know what i mean like it's imaginary maybe like i think like the core behind design is solving problems i think that's all it is and with a very specific understanding what those problems are i think art can be similar but without always the understanding of what the problem is and, and that's the thing that i don't know if is an accurate description i wouldn't say art would solve problems i would say art expresses what the problems are mm. because as it is created by humans and it's like directly created by the humans it's not a machine yeah. that is better than we are yeah. it, the art is only as good as we are yeah or capable in a way so it cannot predict the future because mm -hmm. we we cannot predict the future so i think it's just some sort of a mirror of yeah. reality that the certain artist chooses to show or chooses to express yeah. so i i think rather than it solves problems i think it allows us to look for the solution in a way it more highlights what the problem is it will focus the attention to the thing that's yeah. necessary but there's also you know some different kinds of art which are you know some artists would say well you, it's art just for because i created it for the sake of creating art yeah it's art because i say so so and what, what is your thought on that by the way that's a very like postmodern. i think it can be i think it's possible mm -hmm. i would still as a consumer of art i would hope that there's some thought behind it mm -hmm. and it's like in general i like to consume content that has a thought behind it yeah not just you know you can look at like you know you know those vines from 2010 which are like basically equivalent of uh you know the last two brain cells existing and it's fun mm -hmm. but it's also kind of boring yeah so you know that's my opinion like i i don't mind looking at super contemporary art which i don't understand and it's you know a toilet tipped over yeah. but it's if if you look at it you know 10 times in a row it's kind of boring yeah i i feel the same way i enjoy music that has some sort of sub meaning or things behind it i enjoy watching movies where i'm like oh what did that thing mean as opposed to just something that's like super bad or like some shit like that which is yeah. like in funny fun to watch sometimes well, but yeah it's it's especially with movies it's the most prevalent like you have so many comedies or romantic comedies yeah. which are like the, the tip of this is the hallmark movies yeah which are always like Ooh, this super busy lady from a big city is coming back to a small town yeah. and this uh, hunky cowboy is gonna take care of her <laughs> and make her stay whatever yeah like this is like the pinnacle of it it's it's um it's so stupid that you can you know the plot you know how it's gonna yeah. end but you're still gonna watch it because it's a, like you would just want to relax yeah you're not gonna watch uh shindra's list every day because it's a hard movie to watch yeah. and that's i think that's the, it, it works with the same like sometimes you know some artists have a very strong expression if i be it movie theater mm -hmm. and paintings whatever and you go watch that to make maybe feel that emotion because you want to feel it it's the same reason why we watch horrors because we want to be scared mm -hmm. um we enjoy it being, those who watch wars in horrors enjoy being scared so uh, if you go to a museum and there's i don't know can't think of anything right now but um if you want to enjoy um random shapes mm -hmm. and colors you can go to watch miro or uh, you can oh, oh. yeah yeah, or, or you can if you want to uh, some sorry. point rothko apparently is the most cried at artist in the world mm. and it's just colors pretty yeah. much and the thought behind that is color is the most pure yeah. way to experience things yeah that's so the yeah that's the point like we ch you know you you're not forced to consume art you mm -hmm. choose to do that and there's many forms and we don't sometimes even don't realize that we're consuming art mm -hmm. um, but you know that's the thing like if you want to if you go to a gallery you know what you expect because you know what you're going to 
see there. Yeah, and to go back to the idea of being interested in art that has some sort of thought behind it, I might be over-reading into this a lot, but here's my analysis. <laughs> yeah. Particularly the generation above us, our parents, I think enjoy movies that are just like the shitty things, like easy to watch. My thought is perhaps that could be an escape from these tough things. They have a whole fucking week worth of hard things. They just want to go home on a Friday night and watch mm. some shit they don't even think about. I wonder if for us, we've grown up with all these eminent things behind us, like climate change is coming, nuclear war is coming, robots are taking over, all those things, where I wonder if part of us being attracted to the stuff with meaning behind it is where like fuck i don't want to like have the thing in the background like i just want to think mm. it think of it see it and not yeah. ignore it because i know it's going to come up i don't know if that's like a super to i'll answer both the points so i think that with our generation well our bubble let's say so personally i don't like horrors mm -hmm. i don't like horror movies but the things that are happening around the world are like the horrors that we will live through mm -hmm climate change, war. And it doesn't matter that right now in our part of the world, we don't feel these things happening, yeah. but we will at some point in our lives. And I think in a way we want to experience it or at least get a sense of it, mm. um, just to know what we what we have to prepare for. Mm -hmm. So it's not kind of like, it, I, I don't think it's like doom scrolling or I don't think it's like, you know, those like some, some weird kink of being fascinated by tra tragedy. Yeah. I think it's more of trying to understand the situation and just maybe hope that something we will see will help us in the future, in yeah. a way. To build off of that before you go on to the second thing here. Stories is the majority of how we resonate with information. Little kids, if you want to teach them a lesson, like you tell them yeah. a fairy tale and so i think that might be part of it as yeah. well where we're going into these things that we don't know how to deal with and so a good way to prepare for that is for maybe this also brings back comes back to the original question of the importance of art and things like film is that's like an artist making a hypothesis of what might happen in the future things about no, yeah documentaries can do that in a way yeah yeah and share the insight into this is somebody who dealt with this type of situation and this part worked and this part didn't we can take that into our own yeah. life but yeah what was the other thing with the parents i don't know i feel like every like most parents watch stupid movies sometimes mm -hmm. i don't know i feel like um for example like my mom mm -hmm. always says she doesn't like to watch like fantasy or sci-fi because she says like there's enough crap happening on earth yeah. real real time so we don't have to make make up any more yeah but yeah, she works with like hard topics of like collective memory, Holocaust and communism. So she does prefer to watch a, like a romantic comedy, you know, yeah. Hallmark movie sometimes. But I think in, on average, we watch like good movies. Yeah, I think part I of it as well might be once you like reach a certain age, you probably have a understanding of like right now I'm young and naive, so like I feel like I can do anything, like take on the world, save anything. Yeah. But I think once you reach a certain age, you realize like you can't do all of that. <laughs> and you need to come to terms with it. And like, okay, today I just need to watch Adam Sandler and like yeah. laugh and that's what's best. Yeah. For I can't like always be in that mindset. I have a, another thing sure. that's like slightly related, but yeah, yeah, do you yeah. have anything on this no, before no. as well? So you talked earlier about how you've been fascinated with the public sector for a while. What are your thoughts on woke capitalism? What does that mean? Like, like Watson, like B Corps, the idea of businesses being a force for good. Businesses can be a force for good. Mm -hmm. However, I would not just leave it to their good word. Yeah. So, um, I would say that I think it's necessary for governments to, to take a stronger stand on um, climate change, uh, especially when it comes to regulation. regulation. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I'm a Marxist, communist, Leninist who wants to control or goods being created or or sold in the country um i think it's necessary mm -hmm. and you know 
um, I bet the factory owners in the 19th century protested a lot when child la- child labor is, was being outlawed mm-hmm. because they were losing cheap labor and ran the costs up definitely and all that. And I'm not saying it's the same argument, but mm-hmm. you know, there's been you know, there's been dramatic shifts in labor market and in in um, the way we produce things um, before. Mm-hmm. And I think this is just another one, the same way we will have to adapt, otherwise we'll die. Yeah. So, so we will have to adapt. And this should be as before, as with slavery, as with child labor, as with um, equality laws, um, as with food safety laws, any regulation in general, Mm-hmm. It should be the government leading the 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 effort. Yeah. Would you say that this is accurate? That the perhaps the most efficient way for the private sector and the public sector to work together is where the public sector like obviously they'll need to be responsible for taking action in some things, but like in most where they're not necessarily responsible for taking the direct action for impact, but more just setting the guide rails and a path to flow for businesses to act in a certain way that's conducive to everyone? Yeah, well, I think businesses should be as unregulated as they can be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a certain starting point where we are now. And I think it should not be that the government sets certain limits or quotas and just leaves the businesses to figure that out on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, they should not be left hanging because it's, especially with climate change, it's such a structural change that needs to happen. It's not only that the businesses will have to invest and, and devote energy, money, and time to the transformation. It should be like a societal societal effort mm-hmm. that the government will set up the rules and, as you said, you know, show the path. But it shouldn't be the businesses walking it all alone and, you know, figuring things out, maybe (laughs) looking for uh, loopholes, but it should be the government businesses doing it together Mm -hmm. and finding, because the government wants businesses to thrive and the businesses do need the government to maintain order. So there's a certain Mm -hmm. symbiosis between those two entities yeah here in america it seems like there's a lot of anti-government belief of leave us alone don't regulate our businesses although that's like definitely like a strong opinion for some do you think that is exclusive to america is it it, i don't think it's exclusive um or not like fully exclusive but I think America is the best at that, (laughs) in a way. I think the idea of government, especially in the US, Mm -hmm. has been like over distilled to the bare bone for some people, which is like, we only pay taxes for the government to protect us, to like have an army Mm -hmm. and protect us. And that's all we want, which is like, okay, but that's not how anything works anymore. It's mm-hmm. not 300 BC. Even there, they had social programs. Mm-hmm. But I definitely, it's a universal feeling. Mm-hmm. But America's at the best in it. Yeah, for sure. You came to Watson with a emphasis on civic engagement, right? Yeah, yeah. Was that something you were expecting when you came? Or was that something that surprised you? When, that people had... Like how anti-government people were? It did not surprise me. However, there, you know, when you see some signs or stickers or whatever, it does kind of like not shock you, but it makes it real mm-hmm. because you don't really believe it in a way. It's like, you know, Santa Claus or you know, Tooth Fairy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, but once you like see, oh, it's real. It's like, it's almost like a joke to me. It's so bizarre uh, that it's like, I, I don't. And it's, it's so funny because usually people that are like, oh, I want the government to leave me alone or, you know, don't take away our rights, even though they're not doing that most of the time. They're the ones who are either most vulnerable and would benefit from some kind of regulation Mm -hmm. from the government to be protected by or are already taking advantages from such regulations and don't know about that. 
Do you notice a, a difference in philosophy from Slovakia to here in terms of individuality? I mean, Slovakia is pretty individualistic. Yeah. But there is more... The difference comes comes to this, and that's how is the role of the family viewed, in mm -hmm. a way. And I would say, from my own experience, and from experience of my friends or people, my mom, my surroundings, mm -hmm. I would say that in Slovakia, the role of family is not more important, but is viewed in a different role. And it's for like your family is your family and like you can't change that. And only very rarely in very extreme situations, you like, I know people that like stop talking to their parents or siblings or yeah. whatever. Like, even though if you have bad relations, if the relationship is really bad, you don't cut contact. Like, it's yeah. your family. Like, that's all you have. So, so I think that's a bit different. Like, the blood is very important in Slovakia. In yeah. Like, it's a bit old-fashioned mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. How do you see the implications of that? In a way, it makes I think it makes people more distrust distrustful yeah. to, uh, to others. Here in, in Slovakia, why? Yeah. I feel that we focus too much on like our family that we somehow automatically assume that anyone who's not our family, whatever that word the word family means for you, it can be your actual family or it can be just your social circle. Mm -hmm. That anybody outside from there is not only not family, but against your family in yeah. a way. But I would not say it's the rule. Mm -hmm. I think it depends where. Like, like I'm from the capital, mm -hmm. so I, you know, obviously it's more open. It doesn't work like that. But I think, like, that's the one thing that I've been always taught. Like, family is everything. Mm -hmm. You should not, like, fight. But, you know, so who does not fight? But, like, family is everything, and you don't no matter how much you fought what was the, your argument whatever you always have to keep together yeah this is kind of shifting topics i'll start with a layup okay <laughs> segue <laughs> because i don't know how to make this transition but do you have family from ukraine no no okay. my great grandmother from my father's side was born in Carpathian Ruthenia, which is the westernmost part of Ukraine, which is now still bordering Slovakia. Mm -hmm. It was part of Czechoslovakia in early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't think she would consider herself Ukrainian. She was Slovak. Uh -huh. So there are still many Slovaks living there, or like mm -hmm. some Slovaks at least. Um, so no, I don't. It's the short answer. Okay. <laughs> but with... Slovakia being so close, obviously we talked about this being a big stressor. I guess like, first of all, how has it been being in America here? Like, because we talked earlier about how you're doing a study abroad in the UK right now. And even that distance was making you feel uneasy. Yeah. How has it been being way over here in America? Well, I'm here, you know, I came here with a purpose. Oh, I'm on a vacation. I need to take a break. The fact that I don't have data here and I'm only on the internet when I have Wi-Fi also helps. So, and also I'm not trying to be on my phone. I want to take a break from that because I was literally the first few days, even before the war started, I didn't sleep at all. Like the first few weeks mm -hmm. I was at my, I went to sleep at two, looking at the last uh, news, woke up at 7.30 uh, or 6.30, I don't know, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. and started reading the news and this was the full day this I the whole day I was on my phone reading news reading Twitter yeah and it just was too much yeah. and apart from that I was doing work in school yeah uh, of course so it's like too much too many things in my mind and uh, also because I study when I study um, it just became too real like imagine I don't know it's it's the same as if um, you know I don't know how to say like it. you're studying astrophysics and then one day like a NASA scientist is like you need to build a rocket tomorrow to say or no or or like you know you I don't know you studied you study uh, virology and a pandemic starts yeah 
something you know this, this like it became too real what yeah. I'm studying because it you know it seems like history or it is history but or theory but doesn't really and you can actually see how things work mm -hmm. it's a bit scary to see and also when you're studying diplomacy and the war starts which is the failure ultimate failure of diplomacy it feels a bit futile <laughs> to study diplomacy has it been eerie at all being in america and having it not be mentioned really at all it's quite the same in the uk mm. so i was i it helped that the war like the war started like almost two months ago now yeah i think it's one month and a half 46 days or 47 days and it was i it really made me like angry like the first two weeks when i was in the uk and nobody gave a shit mm -hmm. so but i got used to it so now i'm like yeah I, I can't blame you. I can't blame people for not care. I, I can, but it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. We recorded a podcast for a year so. We talked about how a lot of the big problems that are going to face our generation are global problems. Things like climate change, like nuclear war, obviously affect the whole world, whether you're in America or Bolivia or whatever. And it kind of goes to our conversation about movies earlier. On one hand, not wanting to completely be apathetic, but on the other hand, like managing your emotions and not getting too stressed about things that you can't directly solve or be involved with. What are your thoughts on that balance of oh, okay. not being overly apathetic, but at the same time managing what your attention goes to? I was thinking about this before I came to America. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how angry I am that the human brain cannot accept more stress because I would wish that everyone would be as stressed as those people that are trapped in Ukraine mm -hmm. because that's the only way how it's going to like truly end yeah because if if every citizen of European Union or US and every politician truly experienced the kind of stress people in Mariupol or Donbass experience on a daily basis, mm -hmm. I think they would be more eager to help, yeah. like properly help. So I was thinking about that because I felt it, I felt, I f like f consciously realized that I'm less stressed mm -hmm. about Ukraine or the situation in Ukraine. And it's not because I would be reading less news or I would be just not caring. And it's just my brain blocking it out. Yeah. Which is such a weird thing to realize because you, I would want to be more, I would want to be still stressed as I want was because now I feel guilty that I sort of, I didn't stop caring, but my brain did, or at least my stress receptors did. And that makes me angry at myself in a way. Mm. So, I think it's uh, it's not the it's not that we have to learn to live to balance like caring or not not caring. We should learn to we should learn to persevere with uh, persevere to to battle or or fight against the things that makes us anxious yeah. in a way. I well in terms of like climate change or inequality, racism, whatever. But as but all but. F as well as fighting against that, but fighting through our own nature of not caring. Yeah. Or like not being able to care enough in a way. I don't know. That's a really good way to think about it, I think. With everything difficult, whether you're working out or working on a project, there comes a point where it gets hard and you don't want to do the thing. And it gets inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And at the gym, like the thing you're pushing through is like physical pain, like if you're working on a project, it might be you're tired or whatever. And I think with this, a big thing of it is pushing through that apathy or like that emotional fatigue. I might not emotionally care about this right now, but I should do the things that help it and like push through this portion of not caring. It's, it's hard as well as now, you know, the videos and photos of the war crimes that are happening in Ukraine are coming up. And it's, it's very tricky with those kind of photos because you want the world to see that. You want the world to see the truth, what's happening. Mm -hmm. 
at the same time, for me personally, it's more impactful to see a testimony of a survivor mm -hmm. rather than a dismembered body. Because there comes a point where you've seen enough dismembered body parts and it just becomes mass. It's not human anymore. It's dehumanized. And that's just, that's just a path to apathy for me. So yeah, I try not to, you know, there's like, you know, some people are like, Oh, I have to see this, you know, severed head of a baby, whatever, because, you know, I want to see it because it happened. I would be more like, oh, I, I'd rather not see that. Not only because it's terrifying, but also because what would hit me more would be a testimony of the soldier that found that or something, you know, yeah. like it's not, and it's not in like a perverse way or I want to feel something or something like that. It's more like, like, I think that can illustrate the unthinkable pain more mm -hmm. than showing the wound that causes the pain rather than maybe talking about it. I don't know. What would you say to somebody who's like, it's sad what's going on in Ukraine, but like I'm living here over in America and that doesn't apply to me. I don't care and don't want to care because I can only put my attention towards so many things hmm. and that doesn't apply to me. The war in Ukraine is special in a way that we have many wars before. There's still the Yemeni war going on, which is terrible in a very comparable kind the war Ukraine is. Mm -hmm. However, it's a civil war. The same with the war in Syria that's still to an extent going on today because it's also a war, uh, even though there's third parties involved. Like the this war that is happening is like the first, in terms of international rela relations and warfare, like the first proper war mm -hmm. that is between two states, one that attacked, one is defending. There was the Azerbaijani and uh, Armenian war, uh, 2019, I think, 2020, I'm not sure. But that was basically a border conflict. It wasn't a full-scale invasion of a country. Mm -hmm. So it's like a first proper war since maybe, you know, invasion of Iraq, let's say. It's important because there are, it's, it's a first trial of what I personally think it's going to be the narrative of this century. And I actually wrote an essay about this in a sense, uh, but it was about China. And the fact is that like right now we have the post Cold War world order mm -hmm. and we have the democracies and the non-democracies, what we call them. And what is China trying to do, what is Putin trying to do, or was long term, of course, not immediately, was to create a viable option that would be efficient as democracy is in governance mm -hmm. or even more efficient and it would provide its citizens with the same luxuries that a capitalist democratic society can so the option of unlimited wealth almost and materialism consumerism however with the main difference being that there is only one ruler or one party ruling mm -hmm. so it's not a democracy it's not free and this is kind of what's happening so if somebody thinks that this war don't doesn't affect him especially if it's someone who's living in the western states so democratic states which are in nato or eu mm -hmm. or even uh, states like democratic states in asia like uh, japan or australia or new zealand or taiwan it does affect them because if russia wins right now it's another brick or it's another point for the non-democratic side. Mm -hmm. It shows that it is a viable option, which it, it, it is not for those who believe in democracy and freedoms, mm -hmm. which I suppose if you're living in Western Europe or Western, you know, in the US, um, you do. All right, I think we're at like an hour 15. Yeah. I wrapped up, but touched on a lot of subjects. Thank you. I feel like my brain is bigger. <laughs> I feel like my brain is smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you as well, Jordan. And keep on doing what you're doing. <laughs>